Hello again everyone, welcome back to Pita Chemistry channel. My name is Dr. Ong. In this tutorial video, we'll continue this 9701 uh, for the new syllabus. I'm going to go through the practical components, which are the paper tree for this 9701 International A Level Chemistry, the contents of which are relevant to any 16 to 18 years old pure chemistry curriculum. So in this second bit, uh, inside the syllabus, there's a bunch of apparatus and materials that are, you know, as stated in the syllabus document. So it's not, it's not confidential or anything. It's just every single possible experiment that could potentially come up based on the list of the apparatus given here. So this list, however, are not intended to be exhaustive. That means there could be some additional stuff that are not stated in here, but these are majority, the kind of apparatus that uh, involve the experiments that you'll be expected to perform in a school laboratory setting. And these are per candidates and blah, blah, blah. So if you look at the apparatus, so don't worry too much about the ISO grading. Those are just the international standard. So we could have a 10 CMQ pipette. We could have a 25 CMQ pipette. So typically speaking, we don't really use a 20 CMQ pipette in school so this 10 cq pipette is usually for for you know for concentrated solution so this is your concentrated stock or your standard solution so basically a concentrated uh, solution of which you know the certain concentration and you want to make up a stock solution sorry you want to make you want to dilute the stock solution so you would use a pipette to take out 10 or 25 cn cube inside here and then you will make it up to, I don't know, 250 or 500, but 250 cm3 is more likely given that that is the apparatus that they expect you to have that is further down. I'm looking for volumetric flask. I wonder where is my volumetric flask. Um, volumetric flask. I don't know. Can you see my volumetric flask? Uh, I am surprised they don't mention about volumetric flask in here because typically this, oh yeah, here is. 250 cm3 volumetric flask. So these are stated in the syllabus. So they will expect you to make up a stock solution. So this is called making our stock. Uh, hang on, it's not making our stock solution. This is a dilution. This is a dilution. Well, essentially, it's making a stock solution because you are making a, a, a solution of non concentration. This is more concentrated. This is less concentrated. So the more concentrated one, you don't need a lot of it. And if you just take out 10 CNQ of it or 25 CNQ of it, so you know you could use the very accurate pipette which is as stated in the syllabus. So just add distilled water. You don't use tap water. You have to mention the use of distilled or deionized water. And after you make it up here, you have to do it drop by drop until you get to the 250 CNQ mark because you do not pour water all the way until 250. You do it drop by drop when you are very close to the 250 mark so that you could do it accurately. Of course, you will stop it and then you will shake in order to mix them well so that your concentration become uniform there. These steps, they are in my short tutorial videos on how to make a stock solution, either by serial dilution or either by, you know, uh, starting from the solid, which of course, if you use a pipette, you didn't start from the solid there. Okay, so the mole there is the same. The mole is the same because you're just adding water. So you have, a, what is it? mole equal to concentration time volume so c1 v1 equal to c2 v2 those are what you have done in all level gcse or igcc level chemistry but basically this is the mole of the concentrated stuff which is equal to the mole of the less concentrated stuff the dilute the stuff because you're just adding distilled water that's all that matters your volume is bigger here therefore your concentration is smaller more dilute now, of course, to use pipette, you need something called a pipette filler. So I hope you know how to use a pipette filler so you can watch some of my um, titration tutorial video to find out how to use a pipette filler. I hope you have used one before you actually do a titration practical, yeah? So you have a 50 CNQ burette. So it's quite funny. They ask you to have two 50 CNQ burettes. Hmm. Why in the world do they give you two 50 cm burette? Because you could have serial dilution where one is for the concentrated solution, for instance, and then one could be for the distilled water because then you would have, you would have adjusted the volume of the stock solution, the solution of which you know the concentration, the concentration is known, and then you, you adjust the volume of the syrup solution and the volume of water, keeping the total volume constant. This is the idea in serial dilution. Of course, that is for rate of reaction questions. 
Where else could you use 2 CNQ? 2 times burette? It could also be in gas collections. Not too sure if you've gone through all the previous years past your paper questions on practicals. So there have been questions where they set up the 50 CNQ burette to collect gas collect gas uh, inverted so this is inverted burette in a water trout uh, and they will allow you to collect volume of gas more accurately now of course we also use two conical flasks so you don't get three conical flasks you only get two conical flasks for your titrations after you do one rough titrations you still need at least two exact titrations that are within plus minus 0 0.10 cnq so what do you do you will wash you will wash, you know, one of your previous titrations, uh, conical flask. You will wash with tap water. Then you have to rinse. You have to rinse with distilled water. If you don't rinse it with distilled water, tap water can affect your titer because they are impure, they have dissolved ions. So after you rinse with distilled water, does it matter if it is not completely dry? Well, what do you have inside your conical flask before you titrate? So if you have a little bit of distilled water, little bit of distilled water will it affect your titration or not this is a popular question well it shouldn't affect your titration because what you prepared inside is your is your uh, 10 cm cube or a 25 cm cube so let's say i say prepared 25 cm cube of your actual reactant so yes the little bit of your distilled water can make it more dilute but the total mole so the mole then the mole of your reactant will still be the same because it's just distilled water left inside the conical flask so whatever you prepared out is the exact amount and if that exact amount has the same mole that means it will react with the same mole from the burette and therefore it will not affect your burette tighter at all okay so that's why a little bit of distilled water is all right there they don't give you unlimited number of conical flasks there so don't be too worried if you got a little bit of distilled water not tap water left in there of course, if your burette has got distilled water left in the burette, that is going to be a problem because imagine your burette. So if you got a little bit of distilled water, little bit of distilled water, is that a problem or not? That is a problem because you are going, you are going to pass whatever is in the burette to you know, neutralize or to react with whatever 25 cm cube of your reactants in the conical flask. So if you have a little bit of water in there, so that means your concentration will change. So therefore, your concentration of the reactant in the burette will be lesser because it is, it's got a bit more water, right? So it is, it's lesser, it is more dilute. And if it is more diluted, you will need greater volume. So greater tighter required. So greater volume of your tighter is required to react with the fixed amount in the conical flask. One of the popular questions on titration, to be honest. Measuring cylinders, 25 cm cube and 50 cm cube, not the most accurate kind of apparatus, but they can be used to collect gases. So don't forget, gas collection could also be for that. But typically, we use them to measure our volume of solution. So you could have a plastic or glass measuring cylinder because uh, actually we don't use the 25 and 50 for gas collection, to be honest. We use the 251 for gas collection. So just to be careful, if you have seen those things from the 2016 syllabus onwards, you have used the 250 cm3 measuring cylinder, the plastic one, for uh, you inverted it in a water trot to collect gases. Now I've seen people asking, uh, you know, what, what is water trouts for paper 5 and uh, it's quite surprising that they have never ever done gas collection experiment so I advise you to actually watch one of my uh, experimental tutorials on gas collection and the rate of reaction so you can find it I think it's for all level uh, chemistry which is similar to IGCSE level chemistry uh, setting but you know gas collection is a technique that people will have done back then when they are 16 sorry 14 to 16 years old doing chemistry okay mm -hmm. Now, the burette stand and clamp, that is basically your red hot stand. Uh, you will have beaker as well. So we use beaker to, you know, we can measure solid in there when you want to make up stock solutions where you could have beaker on a mass balance and then you will measure out the solid inside there. You would add distilled water and then, and then you dissolve some of it. Then you pour it into the conical, into the volumetric flask and then you dissolve some more and wash some more, pour it into the volumetric flask and this is called uh, make up a stock solution.
Mac Stock Solutions, but this is from Solid. So this is like this is like making up a cocoa drink or instant coffee where all of the solid goes into the solutions. So the mole of the solid equal to the mole of the solutions. So you will have mass of MR. So this is mole of the solid and everything goes into the solutions. So this is equal to the mole of the solutions. So it's like making your cons uh, instant coffee or instant cocoa. So you have N equal to CV there, which is equal to the mass of MR for the solid there. Please note that the new syllabus will give you a periodic table. In fact, I think I did have this uh, printout. This is from the sample paper, sample paper 2022. So this is based on the new syllabus. So Cambridge published this new syllabus as well as the sample paper based on the new specifications, three years in advance, three years in advance available for uh, for students and also teachers. It was published in 2019. So uh, they have the test for cations, anions, test for gases, test for element. This is new. This is new. So, you know, this could be us as well. Um, very funny thing, you see, there is this important value constant and standards now. It used to be not in the paper three at all. Now this is new in paper three. Why in the world do they give you this value? Because they also give you this value in all the other theory paper, including paper five these days as well. What is so special? Look at this. This is sample paper. This is paper three, sample paper 2022, published in 2019. Periodic table. Since when do they give periodic table in paper three? Well, since the new syllabus was established and they told you in 2019, three years in advance, there is periodic table. And what is important in the periodic table, I know your head has to twist a little bit here, uh, is that they give you the relative atomic mass. Where is it? A relative atomic mass. So all the relative atomic masses there will no longer be given in the questions. Instead, it, will, it can be given you know, in a periodic table you know, at the back page there. So be aware that they could ask you make up a stock solution. Describe how to make up a stock solution, whether you're from a solid and you need the MR there. And this could be one of those things they like to ask you because this is one of those things they like to ask in paper five. They could ask it in paper three these days because now you have MR there. Okay. And you can watch my experimental tutorial playlist, one of those short tutorial videos on how to make stock solution from solid or how to do serial dilutions, uh, basically, you know, uh, diluting a concentrated solution into something which is less concentrated or diluted. So what else? We have funnel. So we use a funnel to fill in burette because we don't want to spill everything everywhere. But make sure before you start the titration, remove the funnel. Okay. A white towel will allow you to notice or observe any color changes much, much easily. And what else? This thing, trout. You see, some people told me that they've never heard of water trout. So water trout there, minimum capacity of 1000 cm cube. So you have a trout like, uh, what is a trout, yeah? Uh, like that. And then you would have the delivery tube. It will go down like this. And then you would establish, you will set up your measuring cylinder like that. And then of course, then you would have your fill with water. So this is just tap water. And this is your measuring cylinder. So it's got lines. And then this thing is gas. You collect the gas, downward delivery into an inverted measuring cylinder. You are supposed to start from zero there. So it's completely filled. And as the gas get collected, the gas will push down the water level and occupy the space there. So you will read upside down, starting from zero until the volume of the gas that get produced there. Now, what else is there? You have you have a one side arm conical flask. Now this is a bit unusual. Oh yeah, no, 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 this is not unusual. This is okay. Side arm conical flask. So this means you have a conical flask and then you have a side arm like this. Why do you have a side arm? Because then you can collect the gas like that or you can also do, instead of downward delivery, you can also do gas syringe. So vertical like that. So this is a gas syringe. It's got vertical. It's got reading like that. And what I'm trying to say is that thing there is basically uh, this thing with the water trout. So perhaps I can improve my drawing a little bit and just combine the two together and save me time. Yep, that should work. So you gotta seal up your conical flask, otherwise your gas will escape. So this is called a gas syringe whereas the one on the left is called a measuring cylinder, labeling your apparatus. 
and these are not just you know for planning but also real apparatus that could be given it's got a side arm that allows you to collect the gas there okay thermometer this is one degree celsius graduation so that the smallest interval is one degree celsius but error in a single reading the uncertainty would be 0 0.5 degrees celsius plus minus and you have two time plastic cup this is to do with styrofoam cup so styrofoam cup one of those really soft plastic and we use them in calorimetry experiments we support them in a beaker so we support the styrofoam cup in a beaker so that is your styrofoam cup they are very very light so do not put them like that on your own always support them on the beaker glass rod glass rod is used for mixing we don't we don't use um, we don't use like um, you know thermometer for mixing in general unless you're in a styrofoam cup this is not glass so you can use a thermometer to mix but if you are in a beaker you do not use a thermometer for mixing you use a glass rod because glass rod on glass glass on glass is better than metal on glass yeah the next one is called stop clock so typically i don't usually use this word called stop clock i would use the word stopwatch so more students will get a digital stopwatch instead and you should know how to you know use stopwatch and stopwatch calculates the time it measures the time in a single reading you don't have an initial reading you always restart it to zero anyway two time dropping pipette this is important in the context of making a solution here you need dropping pipette at the end because when you are close to the 250 cm3 mark you need to do it drop by drop otherwise you will not be accurate you cannot exceed the point and then take it out no you have to do it drop by drop when close to it so that you don't exceed the point same thing in this uh, where am i in this solid going into the solution so you need to you know make up the stock solution drop by drop towards the 250 cm3 mark when you're close to it of course not from the very beginning you only do drop by drop when you are close to the 250 cm3 mark so that you will do it accurately towards the end there spatula is used to you know scoop out solid crucible with the lid so crucible is used in gravimetric experiment so something to do with heating they are made of ceramic and they can withstand very very high temperature and these are supported on a pipe clay triangle now i was asked one question once in a alternative to practical setting and it was quite embarrassing that i couldn't i couldn't you know i couldn't quite i couldn't quite um get it i think i talk about clay pipe triangle instead of pipe clay triangle so it's called pipe clay triangle yeah? it's not clay pipe okay i was thinking of clay pot which is food related but anyway it's called pipe clay triangle so it's got like it's got a cylindrical thing and it's triangular in shape so i'm trying to draw three dimensional here and and then you put this you put this on top of your tripod stand because your crucible would fall in between your tripod stand so you need something to support your crucible on top of it and this thing can withstand high temperature as well tripod stand so that is just the triangular uh, footed kind of stand that you uh, hold the wire gauge on top or you put the pipe clay triangle on top if you want to heat the crucible Bunsen burner the gauge those are normal you need a heat proof mat because these are hot hot apparatus so when you're dealing with something with heating hot apparatus handle with care handle with heat resistant glove so most of the time we need chemical resistant glove but we're dealing with heat which is to do with hot apparatus so what you need really is you need heat resistant glove oops but then some other times when you're dealing with corrosive corrosive or irritant okay uh, chemicals okay so corrosive means they burn your skin they can burn your skin they got like a, a acid pouring out and then the skin kind of steaming off and then uh, irritant you could also have toxic chemicals so irritants toxic chemicals so how do you protect yourself against each of these danger you always have to protect yourself in the lab do not say use goggles because that is the most general safety requirement in the lab in fact you need to use or wear chemical resistant glove this is as stated in paper 5 most of the time and my idea is that whatever could be asked in paper 5 could be asked in paper 3 as well so use or wear chemical resistant glove it's not your usual kind of glove you cannot work with heat resistant glove because these are to do with chemical so you have to use those nitrile glove 
not the really cheap uh, transparent kind of glove but the more expensive blue color kind of medical glove they are the chemical resistant glove there you have a test tube holder and a boiling tube so you don't you don't heat a, a test tube you know by holding it with your hand you need to heat it uh, with a test tube holder so boiling tube are required especially if you have to uh, store a bigger amount of solution uh, because test tube has very small volume and then you have a couple of test tubes there and a test tube rack you also have a balance this is called electronic balance this minimum accuracy two decimal place you see two decimal place in a gravimetric experiment so you need one for every eight to twelve candidates so you know if you have a lot of people in front of you in an exam setting move on or set out your table first you should really you know set up your table first with all the units and the headings before you go to the mass balance otherwise you'll be wasting other people's time the wash bottle contains your deionized deionized is the same as distilled water so you can use either and you will be fine i typically just say distilled water it means all the ions have been removed unlike tap water and this is pen for labeling glassways so you know label so that you don't get confused if everything is colorless and you get confused then you could mess up very very easily red and blue litmus so we know red litmus red going to blue this is the test for alkaline they don't tell you much except that it's alkaline the ph is greater than seven the blue litmus will turn red and this is the test for acid and acid will be ph lesser than seven you also need aluminium foil because you need aluminium foil in order to test for nitrate so you see with oh minus with OH- and aluminium foil, you get NH3 liberated, that is NO3-. Now, this is very important because you need the aluminium foil, otherwise you don't get the NH3. Therefore, that is the confirmation. If you need the aluminium foil to get the NH3, then it's the NO3-. minus. Because the other confusing one is ammonium ions, also containing nitrogen. Just now was nitrate, so don't forget nitrate versus ammonium. Both of them will give you ammonia, but this one, you need the NaOH and also aluminium foil. So equals NaOH, whereas this one just need NaOH to give you your ammonia. If you see here, you will get ammonia produced on warming with your aqueous NaOH. That is your classic, any hydroxide OH-, any ammonium salt, NH4+, the NH4+, will still will donate the protons and when this thing donates the protons proton donor is acting as an acid definition of acid there and this one is acting as a proton acceptor there's the definition of a base and then it will become h2o liquid plus nh3 as a gas i think i shouldn't move that really so plus nh3 as a gas and of course whatever gas you get produced you do not just say it's ammonia because it doesn't work. Yes, it's stated in the table like this, but how do you know it's ammonia? You have to relate it to the test for gases. Test for ammonia, it turns damp. Damp means you need to moisten it with a little bit of water. Red limus turns blue. This is the test for alkaline gas. And then you say this observation. You say this observation inside here. It's not enough to just say ammonia produced without confirming the identity with the test for the gases in particular okay so hopefully that makes sense then what else can i tell you wooden splint you definitely need wooden splint because in the test for gases you have this lighted splint lighted splint means that your fire is still burning so sometimes i call this burning splint instead of lighted splint is perfectly fine but then just be aware that stated in these you know exam guide the two pages test of results burning or lighted means it's still got fire going glowing glowing on the other hand it's just got the flicker so no more no more flame no more flame but flicker so it's just got a little bit of flickers and this will rekindle or relight so they spark into flame again because oxygen supports combustion hydrogen will react with oxygen and it will produce a pop sound but the flame will go away because hydrogen burns in oxygen to give you water and we use water to put out water uh, to put out fire so obviously water does not support combustion they don't mention it there but it's very clear that your your flame will not 
glow any brighter because you're producing water and water does not support combustion there okay so just a brief idea on these qualitative analysis notes so these are in the new syllabus i think everything else is pretty much the same as in the old syllabus what are confusing so i already told you about no3 minus versus nh4 plus that is common case study the other one is aluminium 3 plus al3 plus versus zinc 2 plus that one is also very very common case study because if you look at it this is white precipitate aluminium hydroxide Aluminium hydroxide is insoluble initially, but then it is soluble in excess and OH. This is the reason why it's amphoteric. It can react with excess and OH to give you this thing called Na plus and then Al OH4 minus. So this is the soluble solution, soluble excess to give you soluble solution. If you look at zinc 2 plus, white precipitate of your zinc hydroxide. But then it is soluble in excess and OH. Similarly, zinc oxide is amphoteric, so you're gonna get ZnOH4. But then this is zinc plus two, and you have minus one times four. Now you have two minus, which means I have Na plus two of them. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense there. In both cases, sodium hydroxide does not help you to distinguish between Al3 plus and zinc 2 plus. You have to use ammonia. In ammonia, ALOH three times is insoluble in excess ammonia. It's not strong enough of a base, but then you would have learned something in A2 transition metals that NH3 can act as a ligand as well, but not that important in AS. This is to do with soluble zinc hydroxide in excess ammonia. So this will give you a colorless solution. This will remain as a white precipitate. AL3 plus versus zinc 2 plus, very, very common case study. The other common case study would be chromium 3 plus versus the iron 2 plus because if you think about the if you think about the green precipitate, green precipitate there, as well as green precipitate, on paper they look the same. In reality, in reality, the solution for this green precipitate looks almost like that. Whereas uh, I'm trying to think of a color for the other one. Mm, it doesn't look very nice, but it it's more like a, a shade of these. Ah, that's too too dark now. I'm thinking about it's more like a shade of gray and uh, they said it's gray green, right? But this is actually a much nicer a much nicer green color compared to this green precipitate. This is more like a dirty kind of green. If you have done this, you would know what I'm talking about, all right? Uh, whereas this is more like a brighter kind of green color. But this is soluble in excess and an OH. So this is soluble in excess and an OH. Whereas the other one is insoluble in excess and OH. Now this one, soluble excess to give you this color of the solution. Make sure you specify because you need to specify every single thing, not just soluble or insoluble, but what color do you get in the end. All right, so in both NH3, both are insoluble, uh, green precipitate that there, okay? Now copper 2 plus is a very common case study, but then they like to ask you in between this NaOH, in excess as well as in aqueous ammonia. So the copper 2 hydroxide is insoluble in excess NaOH, but then it is soluble in excess ammonia to give you your dark blue solution. More of these in A2 transition metal, so it's good that you will remember this case study because it will help you in your A2 transition metal chemistry, the two contrasting reaction in excess NaOH versus in excess ammonia. There are some other odd bit and pieces. This is iron 2 and iron 3 because sometimes what could happen is they could give you a mixture. They could give you a mixture of iron 2 and iron 3 salt. Then the green precipitate and the red brown precipitate might be quite difficult to handle. You could also get something called double salt. Double salt. Where you could have two cations. So this is NH4 and then you could have Fe2 and then you could have two of the sulfate this is called a common double salt this is called ammonium iron 2 sulfate there is also another double salt ammonium iron 3 sulfate this is a colorless ion this is a colored ion in solution when you added oh minus unless you heat it you get ammonia if you test with ammonia if you 
and sodium hydroxide, you're going to get this green precipitate insoluble in excess. But of course, you know, so these are the kind of thing that you need to test for. And I think this came out in the syllabus paper, which I'll discuss in the next tutorial uh, as part of this practical tutorial series, yeah? Okay, so double salt is quite common. I've just shown you one double salt. So you need to think about possibility of more than one cations. Another one where I can think of uh, very interesting is this manganese 2 plus. So manganese 2 plus is related to MnO4 minus because the MnO4 minus is not a single cation, but it uh, consists of two elements, uh, manganese and oxygen. So this is your purple color oxidizing agent. And then it will go to pale pink or colorless solution, Mn2 plus, which is manganese plus two. Hence the Roman numeral two there. Anyway, so it gives you this off-white precipitate, which looks more like a, a coffee precipitate at the end. So this is more like coffee color. So if you see something that turned coffee color uh, very, very uh, quickly, so I think within a minute or two, if you leave it on standing, then it will turn to this color very, very readily. Very obvious this will be the MN2+. We don't call it coffee, by the way. Yeah? It's just that one of those things that you must have you know, seen before. Coffee looks kind of brown color. Okay, so it's the same thing in excess ammonia as well. And in terms of the anions, not much I can tell you. The tests for halides are very, very popular. So make sure that you know the color. The white precipitate and the cream or off-white, very difficult to tell. So difficult to tell. And if it's difficult to tell, you need that ammonia in order to in order to tell whether you get silver chloride or silver bromide at excess ammonia this will be soluble it's part of your tolerance reagent where agcl solid plus 2 nh3 aqueous and that will give you your ag with 2 ammonia your ag with 2 ammonia but it's no longer ag it's actually ag plus and this is aqueous plus cl minus aqueous this is colorless solution so the silver chloride white precipitate would dissolve in excess ammonia to give you a color solution but not the silver bromide the silver iodide is pale yellow precipitate very easy to notice nitrate versus nitrate those are common exam question as well i mean if i'm an examiner there's something that i would really like to ask students because you know it's confusing this is nitrogen plus three oxidation number this is nitrogen plus five oxidation number who says they cannot ask you oxidation number in qualitative analysis i don't know if you ever think that who says they cannot ask you okay in both cases you get nh3 but this one is oh actually in both cases they seem to give you some observations so how do you distinguish between nitrate and nitrite well you have to use acidified aqueous chemino form this is given as a solution so you need to use a filter paper so this filter paper actually i don't need a filter paper because these are not gases so what you do is you just add some of this purple color solution to the solution and it will get decolorized that means it contains NO2 minus but it also have to it also have to produce the NH3 because just because you do decolorization does not mean that you are NO2 minus you also must show that you get NH3 when you have this particular test so you do this first test first usually they will guide you and then they ask you to add some of these then you need to think about which one can can get uh, oxidized by this NO2 minus because if you think about NO2 minus, I think the NO2 minus is on top, sorry, at the bottom there. So the NO2 minus is nitrogen plus three. So can be oxidized. Nitrogen plus three can be oxidized to nitrogen plus five. But then nitrogen plus five in the nitrate NO3 minus cannot be oxidized anymore because nitrogen group five. So imagine that it has lost five outer shell electrons. So plus five is the maximum oxidation number of nitrogen already. Sulfate versus sulfite, another common one. This is sulfur plus six, sulfur plus four. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about it. Thiosulfate, very, very common in titration. This is new in the syllabus, very, very new. Okay, I think I never seen it before in qualitative analysis, but now they've introduced this ion S2 or 3 2 minus. So it gives white precipitate slowly with H plus. It's a classic rate of reaction question. It's called the disappearing cross if you have done it back when you were 14 to 16 years old. So as you change the concentration of acid, you will adjust the rate at which the sulfur precipitate out. They say white precipitate, but it's actually supposed to be a pale yellow precipitate. This is sulfur. 
This is sulfur, which is supposed to be a pale yellow solid, but you don't produce a lot of it. So they just precipitate out. Eventually they obscure or they will, you know, make the cross disappear at the bottom of the conical flask. If you are in a test tube, then you know it will just give you something blurry. And uh, how do you how do you spot this reaction? Now this reaction also give out also give out SO2 gas. Now this reaction also give out SO2 gas and I can foresee this reaction. I can think about this reaction as the gas because this one smells quite a bit. Sulfur compound tend to smell quite a bit. Unfortunately, if you are wearing a mask, it can be quite difficult to smell. So if you get this ion, you know it will give out SO2 gas. Make sure you test for gases where it's SO2. Unfortunately, they no longer have the test for SO2. I thought they were still in the syllabus, but they, they no longer have that. So I guess they probably won't ask you the test for SO2 there. Okay. So finally, sulfate versus sulfite. This one, you need to do decolorization of aqueous cheminophore together with the precipitation of these uh, barium sulfite. Barium sulfate, both of them are, uh, well, this one is soluble in excess dilute strong acid. So that is your difference there. Whereas barium sulfate is insoluble in excess strong acid. And of course, there are some other tests. Describe how would you tell whether it's sulfate versus sulfite. Look in the table, know the test. Difference number one. Difference number two there. Okay. And I think I'll just leave it there because the test for gases are pretty self-explanatory. The test for elements, this is new again. New in the 2022 syllabus. So this could be a thiosulfate with iodine, as you know. The thiosulfate reacts with iodine in a redox reaction. And then you will get iodide. Am I correct? Yeah, iodide. And you will get S4 or 6 2 minus. So balancing your equation, you need two of that and you will need two of that. So this one will go from brown solution and this one will be colorless. The solution, the solution color will from year nine, sorry, probably year 10 actually, redox reactions in all level IGCSE chemistry syllabus where you use iodide as a reducing agent, it's colorless. And when it acted as reducing agent, itself get oxidized to brown color. Iodine getting formed there. This is your thiosulfate. Thiosulfate just now will form a white precipitate, basically the sulfur precipitating out when you react with acid and thiosulfate. Your very famous disappearing cross experiments from 14 to 16 years old, red of reaction topic, even in AS level chemistry, red of reaction topic. So in order to make this reaction more noticeable, you can use something called starch indicator. In biology, so starch is used to test for iodine. So in iodine, in iodine, it will turn blue black. So when you no longer have iodine, no iodine, it will just go colorless because you know, no iodine. So it will just go colorless. With iodine, it will be blue black. So without iod without starch indicator, it will just be brown, going to colorless. To make it easier for you to see, you can add some starch and this will be turning blue black and it will go colorless when there is no more iodine in your titration, which is typically what we do. Okay. And just some last bits. These things are now provided in paper tree. I don't know how they're gonna ask you, but I could imagine the molar volume of gas that could ask you on, you see these room conditions and you see this thing here, 273 Kelvin. So 273 Kelvin is going to be zero degrees Celsius. Room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. That is 25 plus 273, which is 298 Kelvin. The way I see it, the way I see it, it will be gas collection. So if you have gas collection, this is a room temperature and pressure. We will use molar volume of gas, which is 24.0 dnq per mole. Now they can ask you why, why not accurate? Because can you assure, can you be certain that you are at 25 degrees Celsius? Perhaps you are at lower than 25 degrees Celsius. Perhaps you are at higher than 25 degrees Celsius. So obviously this one will be affected. And that is when you could be asked about ideal gas equations because you know, from ideal gas equation, P we go to NRT, your volume can change depending, your molar volume can change depending on your temperature, depending on your pressure. So you know, so it could be an ideal gas question, could be a calculation question in paper three, could be quite interesting gas collection and then doing some calculation and dealing with ideal gas now that they give you all these calculations and stuff in there. 
okay, hopefully that makes sense then. They could ask you some redox chemistry. You see there is electronic charge and Avogadro constant. So they could ask you some redox chemistry and talking about one electrons or one mole of electrons. They can talk about the charge for one mole of electrons. Yes, this is part of A2 electrochemistry, but there is nothing that they can't ask you in paper three that will relate to this value here, okay? And what else? Heat capacity of water. That one is just basically your standard calorimetry to do enthalpy change. And we know that the periodic table is now given in your new paper three syllabus. This is from the sample paper 2022, which means 2022 onwards, your paper three will have you know, periodic table given, and it was published in 2019 in anticipation for the new syllabus three years in advance. Okay, I'll leave it there for this tutorial video. So in the next tutorial video, I'll try and go through the, the remaining bits in these uh, practical syllabus component. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to click the button on the bottom right to subscribe to my channel. Follow me at ptet.chemistry. That's at ptet.chemistry on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, all Telegram to get connected. And I'll see you in the next tutorial video. Do share the channel. Do share the video with other people if you think it has been useful, if you think it can benefit other people.